Good morning, everybody. My name is Rodolfo Hernandez from Intercultural Programs at the University of Texas, Dallas. We'd like to welcome you to the last virtual information session in preparation for all this uh, hospitality of UT Dallas to welcome and to receive and to host the new international students who are beginning their academic journey at the University of Texas, Dallas in the spring 2023. Next slide, please. Uh, on behalf of intercultural programs, and in particular, on behalf of the uh, University of Texas Dallas, welcome to, to this info, uh, in, virtual info session. And some of the logistics for this uh, virtual info session is the fact that we can not hear you. Uh, we can um, certainly um, a, have interaction with you in writing. There is an Q&A section at the end of this um, a presentation where you will be able to present your questions in writing. At this moment, the Q&A &A, uh, um, section of this um, presentation is closed, but will be open at the end of the presentations. This in, a virtual info session will, is recorded and will, will be published in the Intercultural Programs at UT Dallas YouTube channel within the next 48 hours. Um, 48 business hours between today, tomorrow, you will be able to have access to the ICP YouTube channel. And today uh, we have two great colleagues here, Anthony Cahill and Revent Battles. Uh, they are pro and coordinators and intercultural programs who will be taking the leadership of this presentation and uh, certainly formulating, presenting recommendations, tips to enhance your success um, uh, at UT Dallas and in particular to smooth your trans transition from your host community, from your home community to your host community. So Anthony, um, you welcome to the presentation and thank you for joining us. Next slide. Thanks very much, Rodolfo. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Welcome to the last information session. Um, it appears that we've gotten into kind of the last 30 days before, before most of you will be arriving uh, for the semester. I'm sure actually a lot of you will be here sooner than 30 days, so hopefully you're all looking forward to it. Uh, so we're, today we're going to be talking about some important elements that you should consider um, when preparing for your journey to uh, the United States and to your life in Dallas. So next slide, please. Okay, so one of the first things that you'll want to consider is obviously arranging a place to live um, on campus or off campus. So UC Dallas does have on campus housing options for all students. Um, obviously living close, living on campus, um, it'll allow you to be close to your classes and you'll always have uh, resident staff available. And it's also a great way to meet students and, and make some friends while you're here. Um, all students are encouraged to apply for campus housing. And I believe there is some availability for the spring intake. However, it is very competitive, uh, especially for the spring when when availability is limited in comparison to fall. So do check on the housing web page um, at this link that we've provided and we'll provide this in the chat after the presentation uh, to confirm that spaces are available. Um, at this point in the semester, um, you may wish to to strongly consider off campus options uh, as kind of a plan B in case there is not any availability for you on campus. Um, next slide, please. So on campus um, housing typically require it does require a partially um, non refundable application fee and. Um, and it does fill up quickly again. So there are three options to choose from. Um, first will be the University Commons, which is a more traditional dormitory style residence, uh, and it's typically where the first year undergraduates will live. Um, and then there's University Village, uh, there's a, the apartments, um, which are unfurnished, and then Canyon Creek Heights, which are the newest and the furnished apartments. So you can see pictures of all of these and find more information on the housing webpage. Next slide, please. 
So then alternatively, you might look at living off campus. And um, there are many things to consider when you're looking for an off campus uh, accommodation, such as, you know, it's proximity to campus and um, positioning along transportation, public transportation routes, um, which amenities will be provided, how long your commute will be, and then obviously um, cost, uh, which amenities were provided. Sorry, it's, you know, some apartments will include a washer and a dryer. Some may not. Um, some may have a pool on the property. Uh, some may not as community centers as well or, or laundry facilities. We'll talk about all of this in just a second. And then obviously cost is a big factor. Um, and whether or not utilities are included. Some apartments may include um, certain utilities or all of them, whereas some apartments may have completely separate utilities. We'll review all of this later. Um, size is another important factor, how big it is and how many tenants can live there. How, not only how many bedrooms, but how many tenants may be allowed in the unit regardless of how many bedrooms it has. You know, if you're, if you're planning to say split a room or share a one bedroom apartment with another person, there might be restrictions on how many um, people can actually live in the unit. So these are things, important things to think about if you're considering living with roommates. Uh, and then as well as not only how close it is to campus and along transportation routes to campus, but um, how close it is to shops, restaurants, and, and if there is public transportation to these shops and restaurants as well. Um, my colleague Raven will be talking a little bit about transportation in a minute. Um, and then lastly, the safety and the appearance of the neighborhood is important. As we'll talk about on the next slide, uh, we do have, there is a crime map that you can check out and you can see um, the safety statistics for all of the neighborhoods around Richardson. It's a generally safe area, but it's always something important to think about. Okay, next slide, please. So most apartments, will include uh, the most basic appliances such as a refrigerator, a stove, and an oven. Here in the United States, um, standard to have a conventional oven as opposed to a convection oven, which you might find in uh, most parts of Europe and I believe some parts of Asia as well. Um, some apartments may include a dishwasher uh, or in a microwave and then a washing and drying machine. So, um, with, in regards to the washers and dryers, uh, it's very common if uh, an apartment doesn't have it, they will have a public, I'm sorry, not public, but for the, the apartment community, they'll have a communal uh, laundry facility where you can either um, pay maybe, you know, a dollar or a dollar and 50 cents per wash and dry, um, sometimes in the form of coins, sometimes in the form of uh, they might have a card or even in now this in, in today's world, they might have a mobile app and you can do it digitally. Um, and if they don't have a communal area, there might be, they might either have the machines already in the unit, which is common for some students' apartments, um, but they might also just have a hookup for the washer and dryer and then tenants would be expected to have their own unit if they wish to have it. Um, if they don't have the unit, the actual machines in the unit, but they have a hookup, you can oftentimes um, rent units for very for, for pretty affordable prices, I believe between 50 and $100 a month, depending on which type of machines that you would like. Um, but there are options to choose from. Some other amenities that might be available in your apartments are a swimming pool, uh, a gym, and some form of community space. Um, typically, you know, a lounge where where tenants can hang out and and um, maybe even a, a cafe or a bar or something like that, depending on the type of unit. Uh, as I said before, utilities may cost extra. It's pretty standard for utilities to be separate if you're not living either on campus or in a student uh, designed apartment, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, so it's typically, yeah, it's it's very typical for, for most utilities to be separate. Um, water, gas, electricity, and then uh, those those would be through through providers for the state, and you would you would get to choose. Um, but then, of course, you know you wouldn't have to you wouldn't have to arrange the hookup for water and gas and electricity. Your apartment would always already be serviced. Um, you just need to have a provider, and then of course, internet and TV 
um, you would need to find your own provider as well. And those are typically separate. Um, some apartments may include one or the other. Uh, for example, my apartment, the water is allocated within my rent, uh, but then I pay my electric bill separately. And some apartments may do that around here as well. If you're having difficulty finding housing, um, unfortunately, ICP, Intercultural Programs, does not directly provide temporary housing, but um, some of our campus partners may be able to assist you and student organizations may be able to assist you. I know that the Indian Students Association um, can help our students, our incoming students network to find temporary housing. So do reach out to your relevant cultural organizations and see if they might be able to help you. Next slide, please. So when it comes to selecting apartments, um, it can seem intimidating at first, but you know um, it's just a process with steps like preparing for your journey to Dallas in general. Um, so research your area. Um, there are several reputable web pages, such as the ones listed here. Apartments.com is a big one. Apartmentsrating.com, rent.com, rent, rent, rentersvoice.com, excuse me. Um, are all great websites to check out, um, both the complex and the general neighborhood. Look at those reviews. Do keep in mind that reviews, uh, take them with a grain of salt, as um, I like to say, nobody really leaves a positive apartment review. Um, typically, people around here that leave reviews for their apartment complex have not had an ideal experience. Um, that's no, that is to say that that's not always the case. But when looking at an apartment, you know, keep in mind that that those reviews are to be taken with a grain of salt. But generally speaking, you know, a two-star review means the apartment's going to be worse than somewhere with a three-star review. So that being said. Um, another factor you can, can use in your decision, as I mentioned earlier, is those crime statistics. Um, it is all public information, so you can look up through the City of Richardson's website, as well as da Dallas City Hall, and see the Dallas Police Department and the Richards, po Richardson Police Department crime statistics for the area that you might be living in. Um, that's a really good tool, and depending on which website you use, you can even look at your specific um, neighborhood or village or apartment complex and see what crimes might have been reported in that area and when. Um, and so I, I highly recommend checking that out because, you know, in general, um, Richardson is, a, is, is quite a safe place to live, but things do happen and things might happen in certain places over others. And it's a good thing to be aware of, especially as an international student um, where you might not be familiar with um, you know, your environment and, and procedures and policies and laws here in the United States. So it's it's good to make sure that you're in a safe and welcoming area. So um, after checking your crime statistics, you can also, you know, look for pictures online. Um, if the apartment doesn't have any pictures, that is a red flag. I would be cautious uh, looking, going somewhere that doesn't um, outwardly post pictures of their complex. So then other things to consider are obviously public transportation, especially if you're not planning to, to work on getting a driver's license here in the United States. The Comet Cruiser is a UTD's bus. It's called the 883 because all phone numbers in UT Dallas have 883 in it, 972-883, and then the extension. So the 883 is the Comet Cruiser, and you can look up the route on this website, uh, the UT Dallas Transit website and see if your apartment, or you might be able to find an apartment along that route. Um, and then you can also check the DART, um, the Dallas Area Rapid Transit website, and see if there are routes, um, and you might be able to find an apartment along those routes, which will connect you to campus or other parts of the area. Um, you can also check the Dallas off-campus housing site, dallasoffcampus.com. They are not affiliated with UT Dallas, um, but it can help you find resources and apartments that are close to the campus. And then lastly, like I mentioned earlier, the cultural student organizations are a great re resource um, for advising purposes. You know, they can, they can definitely tell you what you need to know, and they can tell you about their experiences, especially coming from your country or your culture, 
um, their experiences coming in, integrating into the United States, and then certain organizations may be able to help you network and to find temporary housing if you're having difficulty finding an apartment here in Dallas. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. So once you've found the apartment that you want, you'll need to submit an application to the apartment complex. Um, this application is mostly to review your credit uh, and your criminal history. Of course, if you're uh, from outside of the United States, you probably don't have um, a US record, but um, that is okay. The, the apartment just wants to make sure that you are a, you know, a safe tenant and that you're going to be able to pay for your rent. So you can call, email, or check the apartment's website for more information. And some apartments, and I would say most apartments, would require a, a partially refundable or non-refundable application fee. And then some might even require an additional fee if you are not, uh, if you do not have a social security number. So do um, ask about that requirement. And then most apartments would not accept a cash payment. So ask what they're, what what kind of payments they do accept. Um, most of them, when it comes to uh, making a deposit or or um, paying rent, might require your uh, bank transfer or a money order, which is a, a type of verified payment. You'd go to a bank or to a store, and you can you can pay and get a written check, and it's a it's a verified form of payment. Um, make sure when you do find your accept your your chosen apartment, um, read your lease very very carefully and thoroughly. It's a very important document, and here in the United States, it's required that all apartments um, will have a very comprehensive lease, and every policy that you need to know as a tenant must be written in it. So read all of the literature. Make sure that there are no um, policies that you are unaware of or that don't make sense to you. You are entitled to ask for clarification if a policy is, is confusing to you. So do read it. Do make sure that there's, again, no surprises, nothing that contradicts information that you might have agreed upon. Make sure all of the numbers are correct and that the rent uh, listed on your lease is correct, is, is according to the lease, the rent that you were told, you know, because once you've signed that lease, you are entitled, or I'm sorry, you are required to, um, to uphold it. So make sure that, that the numbers are correct. Make sure that the dates are correct as well, the dates that you will be starting and ending your tenancy with the um and 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 yeah just make sure that everything else you've agreed and discussed with the complex manager um including any fees as well as utilities termination fees are all um transparent and correct and then again like i said it's your responsibility to follow the lease policies and ensure that you know them well so any of these can be discussed with your um with your landlord if you need clarification or have any concerns Next slide, please. So lastly, a little bit for my part uh, about utilities. Um, you'll need to get those utilities set up unless you're living in a um, an apartment which already has a single provider or maybe a student apartment um, which takes care of that information for you. Typically, you will need to um, contact providers, identify electric, internet, and, and other providers yourself, and get those set up. So electricity should be your first. Um, again, unless your apartment has a singular provider, um, such as some do, there are many different companies to plan and plans to choose from with electricity. Um, ChooseTexasPower.org is a site that allows you to enter the zip code, which is your five-digit postal code, and can give you the various plans and companies offered in your region. Um, you can then, then visit the company's site and contact them to get it arranged. Um, things to consider when you're choosing an electric plan is the times of day you'll be home, um, how often you'll be in the apartment and how many electronic devices you will use and how often you'll use them because obviously this will all determine not only how much electricity you're using and when. So you'll find that some plans might have uh, a flat rate or some of them might have variable rates depending on time of day. So for example, you might have um, a high rate during the day but then free nights 
or a high rate or a, a certain rate during the weekend or during weekdays, but either free or lower rates during the weekend. And, and it's all up to you to decide which plan is really the best for you. There's not really an answer as far as which plan is the best, um, objectively speaking. Again, it's all going to depend on what you need and what you're looking for. Um, and then this is a conversation also to have you with your roommates if applicable, if you're going to have roommates and if uh, electricity needs to be needs to be a factor that you discuss. Internet as well um, is, is a service that you'll need to, to, to choose. Common providers in the United States are Spectrum, AT&T and, AT &T and Verizon. Um, not every provider for the internet would service every single area. You can, again, like the electricity lookup with your zip code on each provider's website and see if they service your area. Um, so, for example, I have Spectrum because AT&T and Verizon just don't service my apartment. So I really didn't have a choice but to go with Spectrum. Um, so again, talk with your roommates and you can agree on a plan that works for you because there are also many different rate options and many different data amounts and it all is going to depend on how many devices you have and what you're looking to use the internet for you know you might be a gamer and use need fast internet or if you're only looking to study and not looking to download a whole lot of files you might not need as fast internet as others um, gas is sometimes including with rent but not always you might not um, you might not have gas in your apartment, but you you might do check with your apartment and with your landlord to make sure that um, that gas is including in rent if even applicable. And then lastly, water and trash removal are utilities that you might need to pay for. Um, these, however, are typically provided by the city. Um, if they're not included in rent, then, then they're just a, a fee that you might have separately from your bill, but you typically won't have to set anything up yourself. The water is provided by the city and the trash removal is either provided by the city or the apartment management company itself. So that's it for me. Next slide, please. I'll hand it over to my colleague, Raven. Okay, thank you, Anthony. So I'm just going to go over a couple of other areas that, again, require some thinking and possibly set up once you do arrive. Um, you know, kind of before you're starting to think about classes, these may be some things that can improve your quality of life here. Um, and so we just want to provide a couple of guidance for you. All right, so the first part is banking. So um, like Anthony mentioned, you know, oftentimes if you're doing transactions um, with different companies here, if you're sending up different bill pays, um, as you are associated with your living, um, you may be required to have a bank here in the States in order to go ahead and have access to those funds. Um, and so again, the big keyword we're going to share with you today is research. Um, same with banking. We're going to ask that you research, you know, various accounts um, to find out, you know, what is going to be best for you. Different banks um, may have different fees associated with them. Um, so while you have the, you know, variety of savings and checking accounts, keep in mind that there may be some overdraft fees or low balance fees that could be associated. So um, just kind of look to see um, before you are um, taking your steps to planning what bank that you do want to use, if those are going to be big deal breakers for you, just some things to keep in mind. Um, and also just note, um, there are bank staff um, at each individual bank that are there on duty to help and assist you with the process. So don't be afraid to ask questions, um, particularly at those you can visit different banks. Um, you're not locked in once you go through the door. Um, and so they can discuss with you different options as well as help you set up your account while you are there. Um, also, you want to kind of double check to see if that bank is going to be um, within your particular network. Um, 
as well as if they have many locations available to you. Uh, so, you know, they may not be required um, in the particular district or area that you're in, uh, but, you know, if it is important for you to be close to your bank for transportation reasons, then um, you may also want to seek out banks with various locations. So when it comes to opening an account, um, you could do it online. Um, however, if this is your first time setting up your account, um, it's particularly here in the States, then I would recommend going in person than um, doing it online over the phone, as you will um, often need to present certain forms of identification. Um, typically, you'll need an ID card or passport with you. Um, you're going to need some form of identification. Now, while you may not have a social security card, um, that can be okay, again, just depending on the particular bank, um, as well as just additional forms. They may uh, require an I-20 as well, um, and so that's where it's going to be really important for you to contact the banks that you're wanting to visit, find out the information that you're needing, and then when you visit to set up the account, you do have all the necessary documents in place. So some popular banks that are pretty um, local to the campus itself for is uh, Wells Fargo is pretty close. Um, they also have an ATM machine on campus. If you need to make any with, uh, withdrawals, you can do that on campus. That's linked to their bank. Um, and typically, ATMs associated with the individual bank don't uh, have associated fees with using them. So just to keep in mind, Chase, Bank of America, again, just providing some names that may ring a bell or just come. Um, you may write down so that they are more familiar when you do see them once you are here. Um, that way to kind of give you an idea. And again, each one's going to require um, some different information that they're going to need for you when setting up that um, particular account with them. Uh, next slide, please. So again, just some final um, reminders about with banking, um, checking accounts are going to be pretty popular. Um, they're going to give you access to being able to give, receive a debit card that is associated with that checking account. So when you're using that debit card, you are then able to um, withdraw funds that are within your checking account. Um, again, it's very easy for paying bills online because you could just set up that automatically um, as well as shopping. Um, do you know that these don't um, typically accrue interest? Um, again, just kind of depends on what bank you are going to. Um, and then they also do make it easy when it comes to withdrawing funds from um, an ATM as well. Savings accounts are also good for long term use if you do see yourself um, wanting to be here or your courses require you to be here longer than a year, um, then you may want to set up a savings account and um, this is really helpful because it can accrue interest. And so if you're wanting to put money away to then kind of save as you are preparing your budget for the upcoming school year or just to have that little bit of cushion for incidentals then um, that would be important. Um, just uh, keep in mind, you know, that sometimes some savings accounts will also require a particular minimum um, that will need to be um, deposited in that account as well. Also, um, a key um, point that you may want to consider is um, a credit card use. This can also be issued to you through the bank um, as well as other third parties. Um, again, this is also a great way to accrue interest as well as to establish a credit score. If you are looking to make bigger purchases here in the States, you um, will need to establish um, a credit history and associated credit score. So um, keeping in mind the, the, the credit card uh, is giving you access to funds based on a limit. However, you are expected to pay that off um, in minimum amounts or um, full amounts over the period of that month. Um, so just keep in mind that that may add an additional responsibility um, as that can have, you know, later um, repercussions as well. So just a couple of things to keep in mind when it comes to banking. Um, as you know, mentioned before, this is another uh, situation really where there's not 
we can't really tell you what is the best. You really have to just kind of determine what is going to be the best for you that will um, satisfy whichever requirements and needs that you are needing to be met. Uh, next slide, please. So cell phone use, um, we definitely want you to, you know, be able to stay connected with your family and friends abroad as well as to get connected here as uh, mobile use is pretty um, needed, I would say, and required for um, living here as well, as well as um, getting connected to UTD resources. So um, the key thing would be looking into purchasing a cell phone plan. Um, while it's not required that you need to necessarily go out of your way to get a new cell phone altogether, often um, you can just switch over plans um, and that can be used on your current device as well. Um, there's various plans and things to consider, such as how many minutes um, you're going to need for your domestic line as well as international. Um, also kind of thinking about different service areas and how much coverage you're going to need, as well as data and messaging. So while you're on the UTD campus with your UTD credentials, you will be able to access the Comet Net or Wi-Fi here on campus. But keep in mind that sometimes the connection doesn't take you from your transportation from one building to another. So that may require some brief periods of data usage. So just keep in mind that when you are looking up different cell phone plans, there's going to be um, cost for minutes as well as cost for data based on um, the amount of gigs and usage that you're going to need. Um, also, keep in mind that some plans may require additional charge for international calling, or um, they may have certain countries that are free and others that aren't. So just keep in mind, um, you may want to have a list of questions. Um, you can find this available online as well, as you can go ahead and visit those uh, retailers to discuss you know, exactly um, you can give them even your following scenarios. You know, I plan on being on campus this time, but I plan on, you know, living at home. Um, you know, what kind of usage do I need for a student? Just to kind of discuss, you know, what will be important for you. They can provide you more of that technical support. Uh, and again, just to give you some times or names of providers, here is going to be popular Verizon, um, AT&T, T-Mobile and Sprint as well. Um, also, keep in mind that there may be opportunities for you to lump um, some of your Internet as well as your phone, cell phone plan use or even cable use. So a lot of these companies also offer technical technology support in other media areas. And so you may find that it is um, beneficial for you to get the same company for say your internet and your cell phone um, as it may bring you additional um, discounts as well. Um, you are able to still use, you know, your apps such as WhatsApp, to help with some of the data as well. Um, again, you just want to kind of think about how much you will want and how much you will need. You can also talk to current students for their recommendations. Um, this will be a great point to talk to different mentors as well as student organizations about um, their suggestions. And then again, you can look online to find those specific retail locations. Um, pretty much in the Richardson area, um, most, if not all, cell phone providers reach this area pretty well. Um, but if you're looking for, you know, a little bit more coverage across some of the other areas, if you do plan to travel more, um, you may want to look at some of those coverage maps to see where you can get the most um, coverage. And next slide, please. So when you do arrive, um, again, that is when you will be able to set up your um, cell phone plan. Um, you also understand that students may just need to um, switch out their SIM card um, once they are here. So again, that way you're not, um, you know, conflicting your current plan or having to pay for additional roaming um, while you're back at home. Um, student organizations do have some good um, where you may get some feedback from other students on uh, some of those temporary means. Um, this way, we do encourage you, you know, to come early so that you could go ahead and get those things set up just to make sure that you are making the most cost efficient um, decisions for you as well when it comes to setting up your cell phone plan and some of the other additional steps as well. 
Uh, next slide, please. So a key point uh, that we've referenced to since the beginning is going to be that transportation and getting around. Um, I will say as a DFW Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex resident, um, public transportation here is not, um, I guess, as varied or um, gives you as many options um, and it's not as frequent um, as you may run across, say, maybe possibly your own home country or even other cities and other states as well. Um, and so this can be an area that can be a little frustrating to give you full transparency, but uh, we just want to kind of provide you with some tools and resources that can help you get around. So like I mentioned, is the Comet Cruiser that's going to give you the access to campus as well as some of the local areas around campus that are um, really kind of the touch spots between housing, some um, shopping areas, um, but primarily to campus. Here, uh, what's important to note that it is free to use. Um, there's no ID or anything required. Um, definitely visit the services um, website here at UT Dallas. That way you can get familiar with the schedule as well as the routes. So one of the um, few public transportation um, we mentioned, we do have the Dallas Area Rapid Transit or DART. This is going to be the best way to get across um, the Metroplex and particularly in some of the key spots around Dallas. Um, if you wanted to use um, public transportation to do that. Uh, what is the great thing is that students do receive a free pass. Um, you'll need to just pretty much sign up for the pass. Um, you can do that again by linking or going through our services website. It would link you directly to um, the information that you need to fill out to definitely be sure that you get that DART um, pass. And pretty much it kind of works as like a um, train system or um, kind of bus and train system. Um, and that you can look up those routes as well. Um, you can get to the airport um, as well as different areas of downtown Dallas um, through that um, DART system. Uh, we do have some buses locally as well. Um, again, those will tend to be routes just within a specific city area. Um, typically, you're not going to get across town or um, very long distances um, with those buses. If you are looking to go a little bit further, we'll talk about um, some of the other air uses that you can use, such as um, Uber. Um, Lyft is going to be popular as well um, for some of those longer ways. Um, again, those will have you know associated costs with those, so do keep in mind um, that you know may need to budget for those areas or means of transportation. Um, but as far as public transportation, pretty much the popular or the most convenient areas are that we're going to have for you is going to be that Comet Cruiser or um, the DART or maybe some of those local bus routes. So um, you do have the option to drive um, if you plan on purchasing a vehicle. Just keep in mind that um, that's going to have some other implications involved in it. So um, you're going to need to go through the process of getting a driver's license that includes a written and driven test. Um, also keep in mind that there are fees associated with that. Um, once you purchase the vehicle, you then have to pay for insurance on the vehicle, as well as um, drivers also have to be registered in the state. So that's the associated fee. Um, gas also is going to have to be budgeted as you'll need to fuel that vehicle. And then parking on campus um, it requires an additional parking pass to be purchased um, that will be associated with that vehicle. So there's a lot of little parts that go into um, driving. Um, may be worth it if you're looking to be here a little longer term. Um, good two plus years. Um, if not, that may not be the most cost beneficial option for you. Um, again, that's just a um, reference for you, um, but all of the information um, as required to driving here in the States can be found at the Texas Department of Public Safety's website. We can put that link on what's Q&A opens for you as well. 
Um, but just keep in mind um, that there's a lot more kind of involved when it comes to driving here in the States. OK, next slide, please. All right, so to shift gears a little bit here, I want to talk about food accessibility. Um, like we mentioned, the Comet Cruiser um, does give you a stop to one of the or uh, some of the local grocery stores. But um, grocery stores locally here, um, at least along the route, you can find there's a good Tom Thumb, um, Walmart, Target, and Sprouts. Um, so it's just some names that may or may not be familiar for you, but those are going to be some of the more popular grocery grocery stores in the area, um, as well as um, some key tips for shopping at the grocery stores. Um, I recommend uh, the grocery store that you do decide to utilize the most often to go ahead and you get that on um, grocery stores associated mobile app. Um, that's really great because you are able to sign up for different rewards. Typically coupons are offered through those services excuse me, through those apps, um, that can, you know, then again, help towards your budgetary needs, um, as well as it makes it easy um, for locating items in the grocery store as well. They'll typically tell you, you know, if you want to search for a particular food item through the app, it'll tell you where that aisle is located, which for some of the bigger grocery stores, um, you'll find very, very helpful. Um, you know, another recommendation is to consider, I um, mean, your budgetary planning if you are with roommates is consider splitting grocery store costs, um, possibly making one grocery store run together and splitting those costs um, and kind of deciding, um, you know, what is going to be the most cost beneficial for you um, as food costs are rising. Um, and also you may want to consider shopping in bulk if you do have storage, if you find that you have a place with lots of storage. Um, you may find that paying um, for a lot of one item at one time can help spread out that cost over a period of time to where you're not having to constantly repurchase some of those items that you do, um, like paper products um, can be one of those good bulk. Keep in mind though, if you do decide to shop at a bulk retailer, there's typically a membership um, fee associated with that as well. So just a, um, another thing to consider. Also, um, you just for health and safety, um, especially during some of our more peak flu and COVID times, um, some stores uh, may be requiring or asking um, that you uh, wear a mask. Um, you may even find your personal preference. Grocery stores tend to be a big hub of a lot of people. Um, and so if that is a health concern, if you are, you know, compromised, um, you may want to consider um, mask usage while you're at a grocery store as well. Um, also, keep in mind, you know, your mode of transportation. So if you are going to be utilizing some of the public transportation routes, you may want to consider possibly investing in uh, uh, reusable shopping bags, something a little bit more sturdy, something a little bit bigger where you're not having to carry so many shopping bags with you. Um, you know, it can just be a little bit more convenient that way, um, you know, again, loading items up to the apartment as well. Um, I know that some students may even um, bring little carts with them or make sure you have a cart that way you, you know, you're able to take all of your items um, with you as well. Um, at next, you can go to the next slide. Um, I will share that a lot of the information that we are sharing, particularly in this food section, um, we do go even more in depth into in an Instagram live. So if you aren't following us, go ahead, take a brief moment to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at uh, UTDICP. Um, and we have a great Instagram live called Eating in the USA, where we go in depth about shopping um, and eating um, locally here as well. So again, to move on um, home country food, you know, sometimes we are asked, you know, is, what about the culture? You know, where can I find my own food? And while you may be excited to explore American food, um, you may be looking for, um, you know, that taste of home as well. Um, and so what is great about um, the Dallas and Richardson area is that there are many grocery as well as restaurant options that do provide um, some of that home ingredients. 
Um, you can see um, if you're looking, for instance, um, based on your region, um, India there, we also have general Asian market. Um, we also have the um, Mexican or Mexican American style market um, as well as central market can be um, a little bit more variety if you're looking for um, international foods as well. Just keep in mind they tend to be a little bit more pricey. Um, as well as you're looking for more organic foods, um, those are going to be a little bit more pricey as well. Um, but the options are there. Again, you know, ask for different recommendations. Um, Google is a great resource as well as Yelp. Um, it's Y-E-L-P, kind of like help, but with a Y. That's a great resource for you um, if you're wanting to look for what is local um, in the area regarding a particular food that you are looking for. Next slide, please. So just some tips for restaurants. Um, you'll hear this often, um, but pretty much um, there is a, I would say a norm um, here to tip service staff um, and particularly when you are dining inside a restaurant. Again, that can be a range between about 15 to 20% of the subtotal of your bill. Um, and oftentimes you already see that line item on the receipt. Some restaurants also in their system will go ahead and put out that exact dollar amount so that you're not having to do the math yourself. It will already tell you what the percentage is um, and then you can just go ahead and write that in and total it out. Um, now, some of um, these next two points um, have changed a little bit as we've kind of moved out of some of the stricter um, COVID restrictions. Um, but if you are looking to still kind of have that um, safe dining experience, um, many restaurants do offer curbside pickup where you can order ahead of time go to the restaurant um, and they will either bring out your food or you're able to um, pick it up on a shelf there. Um, most restaurants are already um, allowing full capacity in dining um, and so you do have more variety now um, and as well as there isn't the expectation to wear a mask in most restaurants um, now as well. Um, but again, if you are looking to be a little bit on the safer side or just don't feel like um, leaving your own uh, home, uh, say transportation is a little tight. Uh, we do have um, great food delivery app services that many restaurants are connected with, um, such as DoorDash, Grubhub, Uber Eats, um, as well as Favor. You can order um, ahead of time and then um, they can deliver to your respective um, apartment or location. Um, also, keep in mind that they're going to be associated delivery costs. However, this is not the tip. So there will be, um, you know, you do need to go ahead and budget for the delivery costs as well as an additional tip, and which typically is about 10 to 15 percent of the bill as well. All right, next slide, please. And we'll wrap up um, talking about food here. Um, again, it's quite an um, interesting topic and there's a lot to go over, um, but we have a whole dedicated hour session on our Instagram live for that. Um, but just to give you a little bit of, you know, excitement about some of the food that is along the Comet Cruiser route, we have quite a variety, whether you're interested in barbecue or pizza or, um, you know, trying Mexican food, Italian, there's quite a variety. Again, check out Google um, for pictures and locations and reviews as well as Yelp for the same. Um, as well as to kind of give you an idea of what those menu items can cost. Um, again, to kind of help with uh, some of that budgeting and planning as well. Alrighty, and I think we can move forward. And I'll pass it along to my colleague, Anthony. Awesome, thanks for that, Raven. Um, excuse me. So just to add one thing I thought about, uh, for those of you on Instagram, speaking of Instagram, uh, Stuff to Do in Dallas is a good Instagram account to check out. If you're looking for, for restaurants around here, just all one word, Stuff to Do in Dallas. Um, yeah, provides you with restaurants as well as fun activities. Uh, if you're getting here early and looking for things to do, uh, especially while you know, kind of things are um, quiet around the holidays, and a little after the holidays, that can be a really good thing to check out. So 
Uh, that being said, um, as a last thing before our Q&A opens, I want to go through some examples for um, cost of living, what you can expect here in the Dallas area. So the first three examples are based off of real students here at UC Dallas, real international students. So these are not figures that we've made up. These are figures that students have reported for us. And then the last figure we've kind of um, it's a little bit of a hybrid. We've kind of estimated the rent off of um, what current market rates are are going for here in the Metroplex and here, I'm sorry, here in Richardson. So I'll just kind of walk through them. You can see that in the first three examples where students are sharing apartments, um, rent really kind of ranges in the 400 to $460 mark. And this is kind of, yeah, this is, this is equitable um, because right now, um, you'll if you look if you're looking at apartments you'll probably notice that apartments are ranging around maybe a thousand dollars as a median in the the um one bedroom range up until you know uh, 15 or 16 for a three or a four bedroom apartment so this works out to be about between 400 and 500 dollars a person uh, if you are sharing apart uh, if you are sharing a um a unit and then so the meals, um, I'll save an example four for kind of my last one. Meals, um, you can see that typically around the $150 range, um, this is, I'm assuming, include, including groceries. Um, this is pretty pretty accurate as well. I mean, pretty, pretty representative. Um, if you are um, buying a lot of, you know, cheaper and bulky ingredients from, say, Walmart and some of the less costly grocery stores. You know, Raven mentioned that Central Market and and as well as Sprouts is can be more expensive, more premium because Sprouts is kind of a health food store, as well as Tom Thumb. Um, Tom Thumb is kind of towards the higher end of the mid-range grocery stores. Your cheaper ones are really going to be Walmart and Target. Uh, for those who are familiar with the European uh, supermarket chain Aldi. We do have Aldi's here as well. I'm not sure where the one in Richardson is, but you do, you will find them. Aldi is probably the cheapest uh, store you will find, and 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 it's a good one. I, I myself will go to Aldi a lot of times because they have good ingredients at really really effective prices. So kind of that 130 to 150 mark will will put you in. Um, in for for meals for every month if you are being cost effective uh, about the way that you live and i know that especially if you cook a lot of ethnic food you know using a lot of things like rice and beans and and chickpeas and whatnot you know these these are obviously very cost effective ingredients so moving on we have utilities there's a bit more of a range here and you know there's a lot of variables that can that can influence your utility expenses you know mostly how much electricity and how much energy and how much data and internet you're using so you can see that for most people it ranges kind of between the 60 and 100 dollar mark um Again, you know, the less electricity you use and the better deal you have, it'll obviously be cheaper. The less internet you have or the less internet you use, it'll obviously be a lot cheaper. So I'm guessing that the person who reported $60 a month, this is quite low, to, 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 to be honest. Um, they probably are very conscious about using their energy uh, and then probably have a relatively, uh, sharing it with roommates, maybe have a relatively affordable internet package. Uh, and then maybe towards that $100 mark, being a Dallas native, I would I would be inclined uh, to call that $100 mark a little more average um, monthly for, for energy. You know, that, that $100 is kind of, I think, a standard electricity use and maybe a more comprehensive internet package. You know, I think I have 100 megabytes a month because I'm not like a huge gamer or anything like that. Um, but that $100 mark, I'd say, is more towards the average amount. Um, transportation. So you can see that for, for these three, it's kind of between 15 and 50. Um, I'd say for that $15, this person is probably relying almost solely on public transportation. They may have a bike that they use frequently, uh, but that $15 a mark, mark will, will get you the most basic public transportation. Again, the DART is completely free for you as a UT Dallas student, so you can make 
complete advantage of that for, for absolutely no cost whatsoever. Um, if you're ever taking an Uber, um, one Uber two-way journey will probably run you that $15. So just be mindful of that. I'd say the $50 mark is probably a little bit more average if you are running um, solely on transportation. And then the higher prices I'll talk about in a minute when I get to my other example. Uh, and then social activities, you know, restaurants, movies, et cetera. Um, I think between that $50 and $100 mark is pretty, pretty average as well. You know, if you're not going out a whole lot, obviously movies uh, can be, can, the cinema can be very expensive uh, if you allow it to be. And restaurants, you know, you can spend as much money as you want to on restaurants. But if you're going out fairly infrequently, I think that $50 to $100 mark is pretty pretty reasonable because, you know, a, a mid-range meal in here in the United States for one person, you know, maybe one course and a non-alcoholic beverage, I think it's reasonable to get away with, with $20 or less uh, for, for a mid-range meal. You know, um, of course, if you're adding uh, alcohol or, or desserts or anything like that, the prices can go up. And, and really, again, like I said, you can spend as much money as you want. But I think for, for a mid-range, that kind of 60 to 100 is pretty average. So then lastly, we have example four. And I'll spend a little bit more time talking about this one. That rent figure, we're getting our 800 uh, from the lowest price apartment that we can find. Um, and then the 1300 I was recently looking at apartments.com and 1300 was kind of a, a, a higher end mark for the one, for a one bedroom apartment. So uh, for that 800 that's off of a studio apartment. Uh, some people will call a studio a, a, an efficiency. Uh, in Europe, I know in the UK, some people call it a bed sit, but this would be a one room apartment, you know, just, just one, one large room that accounts for the kitchen and um, living room and bedroom, and then the bathroom would be separate. That will typically run you obviously a lot less than a one bedroom apartment would with a separate bedroom. So for that, you can expect maybe 800 to 900. Uh, and then I'd say for a one bedroom apartment, a more accurate figure would be kind of in the middle of this range. So between the $1,000 and $1,100 mark. And then, you know, just like with food, you can kind of spend as much money as you want on an apartment. Um, newer units are going to be more expensive. Units uh, close to major, either major landmarks or um, popular sites or popular shopping areas will be more expensive. Um, you'll see places, you know, close to the highway in Dallas will, will run you. Um, quite exorbitant rates nowadays. But in Richardson, if you're looking to stay kind of off of the main areas, I think the 1,000 to 1,100 mark will, will probably hit the, hit the target. Um, I will also say in regards to apartments, do be cautious if you see an apartment for a very low rate, you know, um, obviously it's a great thing to save money and and we all want to find an apartment for a low rate. But if you do see an apartment for kind of, to be honest, under that $1,000 mark um, for a one bedroom and, you know, if even if, especially if it's under that $800 mark, look at the crime rates around the area, look at pictures and do look into the listings because it's great, again, to find a cheap apartment, but going too cheap can be dodgy. Because um, like I said at the beginning of this presentation, especially as an international student, we want you to live in a safe area and we want you to feel welcome here in the United States. Um, so meals, $170 a month, I would say is kind of a, um, yeah, an average amount, you know, not withholding a whole lot, $170 a month on meals, um, not too much more than, than the other examples. Expenses, this person, um, this example, you know, you're obviously, if you're living alone, you're going to be, you're not going to be sharing the electric bill or the internet bill, so you will have a higher, a higher premium on those bills, but as a single person, you could probably get away with a very basic electric plan and a very basic internet plan. Um, there's no need to get, you know, a, a gigabyte of internet a month because you're probably not going to be using more than 100 megabytes uh, unless you're gaming a whole lot. You might be using 200. Um, 
transportation, this one says 100 because if you are if you're using public transportation predominantly, but then also taking some Ubers or um, ride shares or something like that, 100 is probably a more accurate amount. If you're driving, um, I'd say $100 a month is pretty accurate for, tra for, for gas, maybe a little less, I think, Personally, uh, you know, I live in Dallas and I commute up here to Richardson. I probably spend in the seventy to eighty dollars a month on gas because I drive a relatively efficient car. Um, if you are driving, do take into account that you'll have to pay for car insurance. It is illegal to drive a car without insurance here in the United States. Um, so keep that in mind. You know, if you have an impeccable driving record and you're able to to prove that, then then you can probably get away with a low rate. If you don't have a, an extensive driving history or if you don't have any proof of driving history, it can be a very expensive uh, commitment, especially if you don't have a United States license. Um, I used to live in Ireland for several years and I actually started out driving on my American license before I switched over and I was paying a quite exorbitant rate to drive on a foreign license in Ireland. So that is something to, to be aware of. I believe you are permitted to drive on a foreign license here for a short period of time, but because it's a foreign license, because it's not um, officially recognized by the United States, it will be a higher premium to insure. And then social activities, I'd say $150 a month is a pretty mid-range uh, amount. You know, this person is probably $150 you can expect if you're going out on a fairly regular basis and, and not withholding, you know, um, social fulfillment. So that's kind of our range of, of cost of living. Um, you can see that it really varies depending on your lifestyle. So there's not really a a singular answer. These things are so subjective, and there are so many there are so many variables, and it could really be a whole hour long presentation in itself. Um, but with that being said, we can move on to our next slide, and now we can get into kind of those subjective elements. We can open up the Q and A, um, and we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. We can talk about any of the topics that you've you've. Um, heard in this presentation. We can clarify any, any matters for you. And if you also have any institutional questions related to ISO, obviously we are the people to answer those questions being intercultural programs. It is our program. Uh, and then if you have any other institutional requirement questions, uh, please do ask those as well, because even if we can't answer them, we can provide you with appropriate resources to find the answers. So um, could we move to the next slide, just the general question slide, please? Great, so um, yeah, my colleague Raven and I are happy to answer questions, so please do ask away. We'll give you some time to type. Our assistant director, Rodolfo, is also sharing some relevant links. We have the link to our Internet Cultural Programs webpage, as well as our international student orientation webpage, um, where you'll find a lot of very comprehensive information. Um, do make sure that you have registered for orientation if you haven't already, as that is very important. Regarding orientation, if you have not uh, already registered, the 11th of January is full. So please do register for um, the 10th of January. And if you are uh, if you find yourself in a bind and can't make it to the 10th, please do send us an email and we can help you get sorted as soon as possible. Great, so we have a question here about US phone packages. What company would you advise us to subscribe to for a US phone package? That's a good question. And I'll, I'll take a few, time, a few minutes to, to kind of address that one. Um, like I said earlier in the presentation and, and my colleague Raven has mentioned as well, um, these kind of things are really subjective. There's not a perfect plan. Um, I will, the link right now um, 
there are several prepaid options that you can find here in the United States. So this is one example. Um, T-Mobile has some prepaid plans. I was looking at this yesterday. Um, basically, uh, phone plans can can be expensive if you are on a single line, if you're on a single bill plan line. And typically, uh, what happens with a phone plan here in the United States, and I know this is very common elsewhere, um, you'll sign up with a contract, and it's it's you know either a 24 or a 36 month contract, and you will uh, pay a fixed amount for you know your your fixed services. And um, I know like for a single line, then you can, um, it can it can be quite costly because I'm I'm paying like eighty dollars a month for for a line with with AT and T um, uh, for for a relatively basic unlimited plan. But prepaid plans are kind of the the way to go for for uh, especially for temporary residents. So if you get a prepaid plan, you would be paying a a small fee a month for uh, a SIM card with some with some very basic phone access. T-Mobile and most of the other providers would have prepaid plans. I know that uh, I think I was looking with T-Mobile, they had them starting at like 10 or $15 a month for I think a um, thousand minutes and a very small amount of data. And this can suffice if you are cautious and conscious of relying on Wi-Fi. Um, nowadays in this day and age, most places would have a public Wi-Fi and most places, um, even, even transport, a lot of transport options would have Wi-Fi buses. You know, a lot of buses will have Wi-Fi on board uh, and a lot of maybe public venues will have Wi-Fi that can be accessed outside. So if you're conscious about always connecting to Wi-Fi and using as little data as possible, these plans can be really effective. So I've shared one for T-Mobile. Um, Rodolfo has just shared one for AT&T. Um, one of my colleagues has suggested, um, let's see, um, excuse me for one second. One of my colleagues has mentioned Mint for $15 a month. So look up the, the phone plans from Mint. But that is the route that I would recommend going if you're looking, one, if you're not uh, expecting to be in the United States for a very long time, you know, if you're only in a two-year degree program, you don't want to sign up for a 36 month contract because you will be subject to an expensive buyout fee if you don't uh, finish the contract. So do, do keep in mind how long the contracts are. But as far as prepaid plans, uh, those, those typically, you know, they wouldn't have an extended term contract because you are just paying as you go. You'd pay a flat fee per month. So um, yeah, the big ones are kind of AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, and T-Mobile. And then um, you know you might find companies such as Mint or Metro PCS if they still exist uh, that would have would have some rates. Um, but again, it's very hard to recommend an objective. You know, this is the plan you should go with because they all kind of have different perks, and it really just depends on what you need. You know, I know that um, a lot of people. Uh, when I lived in Europe, you know, a lot of people would, would the, the the phone plans would have very limited minutes and text, but you they, it's actually required in the EU that a phone plan has unlimited data. So as such, everybody used WhatsApp and sent did all their texting and calling on WhatsApp, which is data. And since you have unlimited, you don't have to worry about minutes and text that way. So WhatsApp and you know other apps like Signal. Uh, are, are really great for keeping your communication on data if you have unlimited data. Otherwise, if you don't have unlimited data, again, being conscious about Wi-Fi will be a great way to, uh, to mitigate that concern. So, so I have a question now asking about uh, documents at the port of entry. This is a good question for the ISSO, the International Students and Scholars Office. They are the office on campus that will uh, that is completely responsible and solely responsible for immigration information. Um, so I'm hesitant to give you an exact answer. Um, 
my director, my assistant director Rodolfo may be happy to, to jump in here and provide uh, an immediate answer. I know that you will be responsible for presenting all your visa information and your passport, as well as vaccination requirements. While it's not required to be vaccinated to attend the University of Texas at Dallas, it is required that you are vaccinated in order to enter the United States. So you will be re responsible for that information. But you may, uh, you may wish to, you may contact the International Student uh, and Scholars Office. Basically though, you will need your, your I-20, you'll need your passport, and you'll need your visa, and then your vaccination information. So uh, we have another question, which bank is closer and convenient for UTD students? Um, this one is, is, is another hard question to answer because they're all, they're all convenient. Um, I know that that you can access ATMs on campus and the ATMs can be serviced by all banks. As far as banks themselves, Richardson has a branch of, of several banks and they're all kind of of equal convenience. This one would be of, uh, again, I would encourage you to do research for uh, each major bank, I'll tell you, and we can publish it in the chat. The major banks are Bank of America, Chase Bank, uh, Citibank and Capital One. Um, and then there are smaller banks and credit unions as well. But just be mindful of, of really um, what kind of fees and stipulations are required by the bank. So certain banks will charge you certain fees to maintain your account. For example, I know with, with mine at Bank of America, with the type of account I have, uh, there's a stipulation that if I have less than I think 1200 US dollars in the account that I have to pay a $5 or something um, monthly maintenance fee. So if you don't have a certain amount of money in the account, then you have to pay a fee on it. But if you do have a certain amount of money, um, it doesn't cost anything to return to, to to have the account open. And similarly, you know, you might have an account that says you have to pay a monthly maintenance fee unless you have a direct deposit or uh, of, of a certain amount coming in. So if you have a job on campus or something like that and you're making money, then you're directly depositing into the account so you can avoid those maintenance fees. So yeah, just check out the major banks in the area. Look on Google Maps to see where the banks are located. Um, you know, in, in 2022, I think it's very rare that you will have to physically go into a bank. Um, you know, a lot of the a lot of things are done on the mobile apps and a lot of things are done online and over the phone. So yeah, it's it's very rare that you'll have to go into a bank these days. So kind of all of them are of uh, convenience. And I can tell you that the Bank of America app is very comprehensive as well as the city app because I have a city credit card and actually I think the city app is better than the Bank of America app. Um, you'll bear with me I'm getting us so um, one of our students uh, assistants has told me that if you are under the age of 24 then there is no maintenance for student maintenance fees for students uh, at Bank of America and Chase Bank. So that's another thing to consider is that some banks such as Bank of America and Chase will have separate accounts uh, that are eligible for students only. So do ask what what the student options are. Um, someone has asked what uh, when will we get the student insurance card once we pay for it? So student insurance card, I believe, um, will be mailed out to you when it is uh, once you have paid for it. However, the student insurance, student health insurance is backdated to the 1st of January. So um, let's see, my, my, my assistant director has, has uh, posted the link to the student health insurance webpage. However, it is, I can tell you that it is backdated. So if you are in the United States before classes begin, um, yes, and something after the 1st of January, uh, if something, God forbid, something happens to you while you're here and you haven't received your insurance card, you will be covered. Um, due to the way that healthcare is administered in the United States, you very rarely have to pay an amount in, in the case of, especially in the case of an emergency, you don't need to pay uh, the full amount or, or really oftentimes any amount on that day. 
in the situation, you would receive a bill later, the bill would be posted to you. So if something uh, in the unlikely event that something happens to you, yes, you will be covered. Um, the event can take place, the, the, the treatment can take place, you'll receive the bill and you can file that with your insurance um, after the fact. So you don't have to worry about access. Um, let's see. Somebody had asked, what is the difference between uh, January 10th or 11th orientation? They are exactly the same. Uh, orientation sessions content is exactly the same, but the 11th is full due to closed capacity. There is a very small chance that the session could open up uh, due to people uh, having to cancel for any reason, but that's highly unlikely. So I recommend that you do go ahead and register for the 10th of January and, and come in for that session. Um, somebody has asked when they can use the activity center and other facilities. Um, check the activity center website. Um, our director has published that information, but I believe that you are entitled to use the facilities uh, once you have registered as a student uh, or once classes have begun, I believe. Um, you ha you'll have to pay the uh, activity center fee but that would be a good question for the activity center. And I believe they have that information directly on their website. And Anthony, I would like to clarify that the activity yes. center itself, um, certainly students will pay a fee, but that's part of the general tuition and fees for the students. So students, all the students attending UT Dallas um, will have a, basically the access to the activity center. So there is no really, um, one entry fee for the use of the activity center. It does something uh, that is embedded by the tuition and fees that all the students will be paying per um, given semester. Yes. And certainly the, the specific timing in terms of the hours of operation, those will be announced in the web page of the activity center, which is under the umbrella of the university recreation uh, division. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, and generally, that is something to be mindful. If you are arriving to the United States uh, far in advance of when classes begin, as classes do begin on uh, the 17th, I believe, which is just after uh, Martin Luther King Day holiday here in the United States, um, all offices and facilities do ha are observing winter hours as winter break is upon us. Um, as this is the last week of exams uh, here at UT Dallas, um, a lot of offices and facilities will have reduced hours until we get closer to the resumption of classes and the start of the spring semester. So do uh, really with every office, do, do go ahead and check out if you are arriving um, really uh, far in advance, maybe after the 1st of January, especially, but before uh, international student orientation, you know, um, do check all of those hours um, rec center hours and, and other office hours, as well as dining options. If you go to the UT Dallas Dining Services webpage, you will find a current schedule of all um, dining facilities on campus. So you can see which ones will be open during the winter holidays versus closed and which ones will be operating at reduced hours. So that will be all, all important considerations to make. And, and do we have any more questions? Just give a few seconds for people to type if they are typing. Great. So um, looks like we're not going to have any more questions. So I'd like to thank everyone for attending. This has been uh, uh, hopefully a very good session. Um, we've covered a lot of information here today. So hopefully you feel more confident and more comfortable about your journey into the United States and uh, adjusting to life in Dallas. If you do have any questions related to the topics today, or related to intercultural programs or related to the university, do feel free to send us an email. 
with uh, with your questions. Um, as I've mentioned, and we've mentioned in earlier sessions, the United States academia is very decentralized, so all offices would have their own specialty, and there would be very little crossover between. You know, we can't tell you specific information from ISSO, vice versa. Uh, however, we are all happy to help you. So if you email in with a question uh, and you don't know who to contact, or you've contacted us by mistake, we are more than happy to point you in the right direction because uh, we know that it is a lot of information and it can seem overwhelming and confusing. So do let us know if you have any questions. We are more than happy to help you. We are uh, we are happy and, and we want to provide the most, uh, the most comprehensive support that we can for your transition into the United States and beginning your journey at UT Dallas. So please do be in touch. Um, we, if you haven't attended the previous information sessions, do check out our YouTube page. They are all posted up. You can watch the previous recordings and check us out on Instagram as well. We have had a lot of really helpful information sessions uh, or, or Instagram live sessions, excuse me, with relevant information. We've talked about cybersecurity practices. We've talked about the Student Wellness Center, the Health Center. We've talked about health insurance. Uh, there's one called Understanding Health Insurance Information uh, in, in America, and we have a great colleague to kind of debunking all of that information for you. So check those out as well. Uh, do be advised that as we approach the holidays here in the United States, there will be a brief period where all of the offices are closed uh, for the holidays. This will begin on Friday the 23rd, and this will last up until Monday the second uh, through Monday the second of January. So for that week and a half, all of the administrative offices at the university will be closed for the holidays, and emails will be very very minimally monitored. So try to get your questions in if you have any before that date, and we will be happy to help you. So thank you again, everybody, for attending all of our vir virtual information sessions. I would like to thank my colleagues. Uh, Dr. Rodolfo Hernandez Guerrero and Raven Battles and Muhammad Sohail Khan for assisting in the production of this session today. Uh, so thank you everybody, have a great morning, have a great evening, and we look forward to hosting you on campus very soon. Have a great day.